specific and accurate and clear, but make it interesting, right? Um, some of you already wrote these down. You can write it at the, at the end of the class. When you're quoting a whole bunch of people, it's hard to figure out what else to say besides said, 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 said through your whole piece. There's some really good words, and they have different nuances. Like if you have this person recalled, quote, da 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 da, they're thinking back to something, right? If you have uh, added, that means one person said something and this person added another concept on top of that, right? So those are all some really nice words for said that you can write down at another time. Okay. Number two, use strong verbs instead of adjectives and adverbs. Did she look around, glance around, or scrutinize the room? Look around is kind of general, okay? Did she glance around? Did she quickly, you know? Did she scrutinize, scrutinize the room, right? Try to describe it the most accurate, precise way that you can. Use strong verbs. Did he say it loudly or did he call out or shout, right? Did they walk quickly or did they scramble down the hill? Doesn't scramble give you a lot more of a visual of someone scrambling down the hill? Good writers rarely use very. Ooh, don't use very. Find a strong verb instead. Their faces were streaked with tears. Their faces, there were tears on their faces, you could say that. Their faces were streaked with tears. It makes you think of those tear tracks coming down and streaking their face, right? Gives you a visual image. Doesn't it? It's not long. It's still short, but it's giving you a nice visual image because it's a strong verb. Um, avoid jargon and big words. Jargon is uh, those specialized terms that someone who's not familiar with that universe wouldn't understand. We have to be careful because we're Christians and we all know what I was so blessed means, right? But someone who's not a Christian might not even know what you're talking about. Blessed? Someone said a blessing on you? Like, what do you mean? So, and, and, and big words are not always the best words, right? You just want it to be clear. Clear thinking becomes clear writing. It's impossible for a muddy thinker to write good English. That's why you guys interview to get a clear picture. You have to understand first, right? You have to understand first what's going on. Then you can use descriptive words that are clear, not flowery or awkward. Here's a, a sentence I just wrote yesterday. Bob's pulse quickened as the two burly young men built like NFL players followed them. Okay, so if I say they're built like NFL players, you know these guys are big. And at first when I wrote that sentence, I just said burly young men, and I thought, that's not strong enough. Why is Bob so nervous about burly young men following him? Built like NFL players, oh. <laughs> you know, these guys are built like refrigerators with feet, right? Okay, here's another good skill that anyone can do to improve their writing. Vary your short and your long sentences. Long sentences give description and depth. It's good to have long sentences, right? Short sentences give the reader time to breathe or can add a quick punch for emphasis. Look at this paragraph. Underline the short sentences below. Sometimes it helps to read your writing out loud to see if you have enough pauses, to see if you have a nice rhythm, to see if you let your reader breathe. If you can't read your piece out loud and breathe, <laughs> then you're not giving your reader enough pauses, right? It's almost like music. So here, I'll read this out loud. Though it happened in a few seconds, it was as if time slowed down. Hector felt and saw the wheels of the Jeep go over him, but he also felt the weight of the car lifted off of him. That's a long sentence, right? He believed he was dying. That is short, and it's also powerful. In this moment, this young man thinks, I'm dying right now. Lying in the street with his eyes closed, he thought about eternity. He knew that he deserved hell. Another really short I deserve hell, right? He knew that God had given him every opportunity through his Christian grandmother making him read the book of Revelation to her, through the free English class and Bible studies, through the tapes of Pastor Chuck explaining who Jesus was. That was a really long sentence. We need a break soon. In his mind, he told God, I'm sorry, Lord. That's a really powerful sentence, too. We need to repent. We need to say sorry to the Lord. I know that you gave me so many chances. I know that it's my fault that I will be separated from you forever. When he opened his eyes, he couldn't believe that he was still alive. 
So you see how we needed those short sentences? We needed them short because they were really important. They were like that little knockout punch, boom. But we also needed the long ones so that we could imagine this Jeep going over the sky and the wheels miraculously lifting off of him, right? So you don't want too many short sentences, da 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 right? Because then you're going to feel like you're in a marching band and, you know, but you don't want to la 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 you know what I'm saying? You want to vary your short and long. And that's, it's actually kind of fun to do that with your writing when you go back and revise. Look, what is, what could I have as a short sentence? What's my most important concept here? He knew he was dying. That's really important. That he's thinking right now, I'm dying, right? I'm sorry, Lord. Like he's, he is repentant. In that moment, he's repenting, right? Okay. Um, you also want to keep up the pace. The paragraph below does a lot of work, giving dialogue, conveying excitement, and educating the reader about the Civil War in Colombia. See how it doesn't slow down. This happened not magically, <laughs> but through multiple revisions. Okay? Ed shouted, Naomi, Naomi, come here. This is the grandson of Juan Evangelista and Amelia de Carmen. Naomi hurried over and two questioned him. Was his grandfather dead? Hector explained that he was killed in La Violencia, the 1950s civil war against liberals, namely communists and evangelical Christians. What about your grandma, Ed asked. Hector told them that she survived and was living two blocks away. Within half an hour, they were face to face with Amelia again after 30 years. That's a lot of information, but we went chicka 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 chicka, right? We went boom, 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 boom. So if you can, if you have an opportunity and the situation calls for it, this situation called for it because it was so exciting. It's, it's hard to imagine it in just one paragraph. The whole story is not here, but it's in issue 75. These missionaries had actually led his grandparents to the Lord. Then there had been a civil war. Almost all the Christians died. And then this guy meets them in an English class 30 years later. And they're like, what? You're their grandson? Where are they? Are they alive? You know, so there's a lot of... This was a moment with whew, lots of excitement, so you want the writing to kind of reflect that excitement, and it's just quickly, boom, 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 boom. Where is she? She's still alive. Da, 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 da. Where, you know, let's go find her. Let's go see her. Um, so try to keep up when you have, it's kind of those stories that have a lot of natural energy, hurricane stories, uh, stories where something's happening quickly, something where something really exciting is going down. Try to capture that with the way that you're telling the story, right? Um, the quotes are really helpful, right? Naomi, Naomi, come over here, right? Because you're letting the dialogue bring that excitement, right? Okay. Number six, revise, revise, revise. Not just one time, continually. Zinzer said, a clear sentence is no accident. Very few sentences come out right the first time or even the third time. Remember this in moments of despair. If you find that writing is hard, it's because it is hard. Doesn't mean you're a bad writer. It's just writing is hard. Okay. Let's get to the last couple pages here. All right. Do's and don'ts, CCM style. Now this, um, this is very specifically for the magazine. For most of our feature stories, CCM uses narrative style. Um, we talked about how that's telling a story, getting inside someone's head. We take a straight journalistic approach in third person, he, she, it. Um, but we use detailed descriptions and examples. So number one, avoid editorializing. Editorializing is inserting one's opinion into the story or using words that could be merely the writer's opinion. Of course, in the editor letter, that's different. It's an editor letter. We all know that it's Tom's opinion. If an opinion is presented in the story, it must have a source. The pastor describing the surroundings, someone you're interviewing describing their feelings. Those, those are fine because they have a source, but you, the writer, can't use words that have an opinion. So, for example, New Orleans is a spiritually dark place. Few places on earth have seen the devastation and hardship they have. But God has not forgotten New Orleans. He loves this city. Whoa! You are taking a lot of liberties as a writer, right? New Orleans is a spiritually dark place. Says who? Says Calvary Chapel Magazine? What are you talking about? Why? Right? 
Few places on earth have seen the devastation and hardship they have. Well, now that's just not even true, right? Are we talking about the entire earth and all of time? Then that's a little bit of an exaggeration, right? Now you're losing credibility. Um, but God has not forgotten New Orleans. Okay, well, I believe that because God hasn't forgotten anybody, but now you're kind of speaking for God. Okay, this is getting weird. It's just getting weird, honestly, right? Um, the reader may think, how do you know? Who are you to speak for God? So a straight, more journalistic style where you're just telling the facts and you're letting um, the people you're interviewing explain those things. New Orleans was the hardest hit area during Hurricane Katrina in 2005. Okay, yes, you can say that. This is a well-known fact, easily documented online. I'm specific, I'm telling you. But some believers feel that God has used even the destruction for good. Who feels that way? Some believers. Some believers. Not me, the writer, right? Pastor Kevin Cox, now I have to prove that really quickly, right? Pastor Kevin Cox of CC New Orleans described the Crescent City as, quote, his words, a place where darkness had spread like a giant veil, comma, adding that, quote, God is lifting that veil through the word of God and his children coming to show the love of Christ, end quote. Now the reader has evidence. Someone who lives there is giving their opinion, which makes it a valid opinion, right? The opinion of a CC Magazine writer is not as authoritative. Who's Christmas Beeler? Why does she know all this stuff? Who, should I believe her? Well, this is Pastor Kevin Cox of CC New Orleans. He lives there, right? I can quote him. All right, so just be careful not to editorialize and put your opinions in your writing. Now, you can state facts, that's fine. And you can quote other people's opinions, that's fine. Number two, this is a really common mistake, I think because we as believers, we know what each other means when we say these things. God told me this, God said this. And almost every story, you're trying to get to the deeper thing of what the Lord's doing. So almost every story, you have someone saying, and then God told me to move to Fredericksburg or whatever. But we have to be really careful how we said, God said, or God told me. Let me explain. There are many reasons, okay, in almost every story, people will tell us they felt God speaking to them. There are many reasons that we will never directly quote God as speaking unless we're quoting scripture. First, many cults claim to receive extra biblical revelations or messages from God, and we want no part of adding to scripture, right? Secondly, Calvary Chapel has a strong emphasis on God's revelation to people through the Bible, right? So if we're going to quote God, it better be scripture. Otherwise, don't put the quotation marks, okay? But we do want our readers to know that the Lord is still speaking to his people today. So we handle his personal communications to his children carefully. For example, right, don't say or don't put non-scripture words of God in quote marks. Just never do it. Even if the people, as they're telling you the story, if they say it that way. Then God told me, quote, move to Fredericksburg. Okay, you can't write it that way. Okay, because <laughs> it's going to look funny that God said, move to Fredericksburg, right? But you can paraphrase it without the quotation marks. So don't say, God told John to start a church in Cleveland. Why not? That seems fine to me. It seems a little odd to say, God told John, right? Imagine that you're a new Christian or a non-Christian. You're like, these kind of chapel people, they're saying God said all this stuff. John felt God leading him to start a church in Cleveland. That's a little safer. It's a little, we're not saying, Calvary Chapel Magazine says that God told John this. Okay, they were saying, John felt God leading him to do this. It's different. It may seem like the same thing, but it's softening it, and we're not declaring that we know that God told John this thing. Does that make sense? We're just sort of putting it in John's court. We're saying that John felt this way. Okay. Dave recalled, quote, don't do this. Dave recalled, quote, then God told me, Dave, you must follow me, quote. Rather, we would say this. Dave sensed that Jesus was calling him to follow him personally. We still have the thought. We still have the fact that Dave felt this was a personal moment with the Lord, but we don't have to use the quotation marks. Maybe it looks silly to say God said Dave, <laughs> right? But just, okay. As she prayed, she felt God whisper, quote, I love you. I'm sure that people hear God say that. I've heard God say that to me, but it just looks odd in print 
to put those quotation marks like that. So do this instead. As she prayed, she felt God's love for her. Or she sensed that God was showing her that he loved her. Right? It's okay. We're just taking it out of the quotation marks. Teresa recalled, comma, God told me I am the way, the truth, and the life. And you might be tempted to put that in there because you say, well, that is scripture. Let's just soften it a little more and say, Teresa recalled Jesus' words in John 14, 6 a. Ooh, scripture reference. We have, you can go find it as the reader. You can find this yourself now. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now we can use quotation marks because we're quoting straight scripture. Does that make sense? Okay. It's just, it comes up in almost every story. That's why I went over it so much in detail. All right, number three, we're going to avoid Christianese. Since the magazines go to a variety of places, prisons, colleges, doctors' offices, we try to write clearly so even an unsaved person can understand the story. We don't water down the gospel. We just are avoiding Christian jargon. All right, the ministry has blessed many. That is so vague, isn't it? We already talked about that. Many people have come to Christ or been encouraged through the ministry. There we go. That's two specific ways that it's been a blessing. She sought God for confirmation. Now, a non-Christian is going to say, what's confirmation? Isn't that like a Catholic thing? Right? She prayed and asked God to show her that she was doing what he wanted, or however you would word that. They sought divine appointments. Whoa, that sounds really mystical and kind of strange, right? They looked for God-given opportunities. That makes more sense. That's what we mean, right? So it's kind of fun to take the Christian needs out. Just, just try to make... Think of it as if I were a non-Christian or a new Christian, would I understand this? You know, Because actually, we want the new Christians or non-Christians to understand this, right? Rule of thumb, would an unsaved person get the basic gist of what you're saying? Could it be misinterpreted to be cultish, weird, or unscriptural? So that's always a good, just general thing to keep in mind when you're revising. Other things we avoid, we don't use first person, I mean my. Uh, in the story. We do use it in a quote, obviously, but we're not going to use it as we're writing, right? The story is not about the writer or the photographer. We avoid using the name of another denomination or group to make a generalization. We wouldn't say, quote, I grew up Catholic, so I wasn't safe, quote. Even if the person said that, we're not going to write that, because that's like we're declaring that there are no saved Catholic people out there. We're just not going to do something like that, okay? So rather we would say, she grew up in a traditional religion that did not teach that one can personally know Jesus Christ. Because that's what she means. That's what she's trying to say, right? We avoid focusing on how the person doing the ministry was blessed. People frequently, we've talked about this before, people frequently say things like, I thought I was going to minister to the people of Mexico, but they really ministered to me. We would not use this. Why not? It's too vague. It doesn't teach anything or prove anything. Second, the focus of the story is not on the Christian's feelings, but how unbelievers were impacted by the Lord. Now, if a youth group is going and the Lord touches them, you can see that there's some value in that because these are young people who are still growing in their faith. Maybe they weren't even believers, and then they went on this trip, and then the Lord touched them. You can see how that might be. But otherwise, we really don't talk about how the team... Uh, and even then we try to get them to be specific, not just, it was rad, I was stoked, it was awesome, but well, what, you know, what specifically did God teach you? So grammar fundamentals, I know, I, I don't want to insult anybody by talking about grammar fundamentals, but I find so often as a writing teacher that people just need a little reminder. It's been a long time, maybe, since you've been in an English class, right? And writing, you need to know how to use the language, you need to know how to write a sentence. So please, please do not be offended. This is just to remind you of stuff that you already know. We all know that you already know it. It's just a reminder. Okay. What is a sentence? Give me three essential elements. Essential, a sentence always has a subject, verb, verb or predicate, Adjective. and a what? Adjective. A complete Adjective. thought. Adjective. Okay, write that down always has a subject, it always has a predicate, it always has a complete thought. And you might think, well, duh, <laughs> right? But you'd be surprised at how often a sentence, a group of words can feel like a sentence, that it doesn't have one of these, okay? So bear with me. 
The last one, the complete thought, is actually very important. Many times if a sentence is lacking a complete thought, it is a fragment, okay? For each sentence below, underline the subject once, the verb twice, and put a check mark if it has a complete thought. If it is missing one of the three elements, put an X. Peter and John ran to Jesus' tomb. Subject? Peter and John. Predicate? Complete thought. Where did they run? To Jesus' tomb. Complete th sentence? Yeah. Yes. The disciple Peter had a passionate faith. Um, subject? Peter. Peter. Predicate? Had? Yeah. Complete thought. He had a what? Passionate faith. Complete sentence? Yeah. Yes. They found it empty. Subject? Mm -hmm. Predicate? Found. Found what? It. Found it empty. Complete thought? Yes. Yeah. Because Jesus had written, risen. Subject? Jesus. Jesus. Predicate? Yeah. Had or had risen. Complete thought? Yeah. No. What word is throwing that off from being a complete thought? Because. Because is a cause-effect word. So you're giving me the cause, but you're not giving me the effect. If I say because Jesus is risen, you're saying, where's the rest of the sentence? You're not giving me a complete thought. That's a really easy way to recognize a fragment. If it leaves you wanting more. If it's not a finished thought. But you're like, well, Christmas, it has a subject and it has a predicate. Yes, but it's not a complete thought. Okay? Who was his Lord and Savior? What's my subject? It's a little confusing, right? It could be who, but predicate was? Complete thought? No. No, not really. It's more like a question. It's more like a question. Who was his Lord and Savior? Okay. Now, really, when you're looking at your writing, if you want to practice this on your writing, underline your subject once, your verb twice, and then put a check if it has a complete thought. That's something that you might want to do later on your own. Now, this might seem odd, but it's actually very helpful. Prepositional phrases. Sometimes to find this subject, it helps to eliminate the prepositional phrases and dependent clauses. The subject of the sentence will never be inside a prepositional phrase or a dependent clause. A preposition it's a long word. All it means is it's a directional word, right? It usually describes where something is in space or time. So in space, like in the physical <laughs> universe, in space, above, around, along, below, beside, by, over, under, through. If it's a directional word like that, it is a preposition. In time, it's telling when or where something happened in time, before, after, during, since. And the other really common prepositions are to, from, for, with, and of. And why is this helpful? Because if you can isolate your prepositional phrases, you know my subject is not in there. Neither is your predicate, okay? They're just extra uh, phrases in your sentence that give description. So if we say, over the river and through the woods to grandmother's house we go, how many prepositional phrases do you see? The prepositional phrase is going to be the preposition, it's going to start with the preposition, it's going to end with the object of the preposition. Over the what? River. River. So put uh, parentheses, those little curvy brackets around over the river. That's one prepositional phrase. Through the woods. Through the woods, very good. That's our next one. Through the what? Through the woods. That's our next prepositional phrase. To grandmother's, to grandmother's where? House. house. To grandmother's house we go. Mm -hmm. Now, when you first looked at that sentence, there were a lot of nouns in there. And it's like, which one of those is the subject? Is it river? Is it woods? Is it grandmother? What is the subject? Well, now we, t we got all those prepositional phrases out of the way. And we're only left with two words. What are we left with? We're left with we go. Well, what's my subject? We. we. And what are we doing? Go. Wow. So we, underline it once, that's your subject. Mm -hmm. We go. Underline we once and go twice, that's your predicate. Now if I had put that sentence before you and said, where's your subject and predicate? Who knows what we all would have thought. 
But if we can take the prepositional phrases out of the way and say, oh, the subject is we, what are we doing? Go. There we go. Now we do know where we went because we had all those prepositional phrases, so we have a subject, a predicate, and a complete thought, right? We have a, a, a sentence. <coughs> In the summer, before school starts, people go on vacation to the beach or out of town. Now if I were to say, which, which of those is your subject? Some of you could figure that out, but some of you would just be going, oh my gosh, I don't know, look at all the nouns. So let's take some of those prepositional phrases out. In the? Okay, what's our next one? Before school starts. Good, before school starts. On vacation. On vacation. To the beach. In the house. Good, so now we're left with what? People. People go. People go. People go. What's my subject? People. What's my predicate? Go. Excellent. Do we have a complete sentence? Yes. Yes, we do. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans <laughs> white with foam, God bless America. Right? Give me some prepositional phrases. From the mountains. Good. To the prairies. Good. To the ocean. Good. That's it. With? Oh, with foam. Good. Okay, so we're left with? God bless America. God bless America. And really, oceans white, re white really goes with oceans, so. Mm -hmm could say to the oceans white is a prepositional phrase. So that means God bless America. Who's my subject? God. What's my predicate? Bless. Bless who? America. Okay. Do I have a complete sentence? Yes. Yes, I do. Prepositional phrases always act as an adjective or adverb describing something in the sentence, right? Um, other dependent clauses may contain a noun and a verb, and they start with a signal word such as who, which, that, what, when, while, because, if, or a preposition. Put a bracket around the dependent clauses and uh, the curved parentheses around the prepositional phrases. Then put a check mark if it is a complete sentence or X if incomplete. Okay, we're gonna help you with this. All right, so remember how we were up at the top? We said because Jesus had ris risen, wasn't, a sentence because it was incomplete. Okay, so we're looking for more things like that. We're looking for these clauses that start with a word like who, which, that, what, when, while, because, if, or a preposition. Okay? I confess that I ate the entire pie that was sitting on the counter. Let's start grouping things into phrases and clauses. There's at least one prepositional phrase in there, right? Mm-hmm, on the counter. That was sitting. Good. That I ate. Good. And you can even put the entire pie in that clause. So if we take away that I ate the entire pie as one clause, that was sitting as one clause, and on the counter as a phrase, mm -hmm. that leaves us with what? I confess. I confess. Right? So we have a subject, we have a predicate, and we have a complete thought. Do we have a complete sentence? Yes. Yes, we do. Okay, and you guys do the next one. Give me a prepositional phrase. In the minds of Moria. In the minds of Moria. To okay. The to the death. Over the precious kingdom. Good. Over I got a clause in there. What is it? Kingdom. That kingdom. starts with that. That was filled. That was filled. Oh, I'm sorry, with Mithril. And with Mithril is your prepositional phrase. Mm -hmm. So we take all that stuff away, we have what? The dwarves and the orcs. Ward. The or the dwarves and the orcs ward. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So our subject is Wars. dwarves and orcs. And then our predicate is ward. Ward. I wrote this for my high school English class. <laughs> Um, so we have a subject and a predicate and a complete thought. Mm -hmm. So we have a sentence. Now, before I was attacked by the vicious man-eating chihuahua that lives on my street and haunts my dreams. There's a lot going on. Feels like a complete sentence, but is it? Okay, give me a, give me a, a phrase or a clause. Before I was attacked. Mm -hmm. On my street. The by the 
by the vicious man-eating chihuahua that lives on my street and haunts my dreams. Where's my subject? If everything's in a clause or a phrase, where's my subject? There isn't one. Every single word is taken up in a clause or a, phrase, a prepositional phrase. Now, if you took out the word before, well, that changes everything, right? It's okay. I would be the subject. I would be the subject, right. Okay. This is just something maybe to do some work searching online, go through some of these exercises, um, ways to punctuate two independent clauses. An independent clause is the sentence that it talks about all that. So that's just something for you to, to study more on your own. Because as a writer, yes, there are editors who are going to look at your stuff, but we expect that you can write a sentence. Right? We don't want to have to revise every single sentence that you write. Okay? And it's, it's, it's nothing to be ashamed of or worry about. You can, you can remind yourself what a sentence is, what a sentence has to have, what a sentence looks like, how to write it better, how to write it clearer. Okay? Okay. Now, on, on some blank piece of paper or on the back of one of your sheets, I'd like you to draw two triangles. The first one, I'd just like you to draw a regular triangle with a point on top and this flat part on the bottom. Draw it kind of big, okay? Now leave a, an inch or two or a couple inches below that. Now draw a triangle that looks like this with the flat on the top and the point on the bottom. So leave yourself some room between your two triangles because you're gonna label them. Okay. In journalism, there is a concept called the inverted pyramid. But before I explain what that is, I'm going to explain what this is because you're more familiar with this. This is a normal paragraph structure or normal essay structure that you probably learned in high school or college. Okay. <clears throat> the interesting thing is that this can describe a paragraph. It can also describe an entire essay. Right. So in a normal paragraph, we start with the what? What's T S? Topic sentence. Right? In a normal paragraph, we start with a topic sentence on the top. TS, or you can write topic sentence, whatever you want to say. Um, and that would be something like, um, the missions team went to Congo. Okay? That's your topic sentence. It's telling me the general idea of this paragraph, right? Then you would have details. They went here, they went there, they did this, they did that. And then you would end your paragraph with a conclusion sentence or maybe uh, an interesting point, however you write, sometimes a transition. But you have your conclusion sentence here on the bottom. This is a normal paragraph for like an English paper or English class, right? But journalism is not structured the same way. Yes, you can have paragraphs in your story, but in general, um, you're going to structure at least your um, first paragraph this way. You're going to start with your most, your hook, your hook slash your most important detail. Now if you go back to your page where we were talking about the Congo, the page was wrong guys. That was page 27, 27. exercise 2. And actually I think Ronnie did this or Barb did this. Somebody might have done this. I can't remember. What is the most important part of that whole paragraph? The Congo paragraph? Mm hmm. What's the most important piece of information? That more than 200 children prayed to receive you got the it. Christ. You got it. That's our most important piece of information. As this paragraph is written, it's at the bottom, right? Mm -hmm. But journalism style, we put that puppy at the top because that is our most important piece of information. Why do we write this way in journalistic style? Well, there's a lot of reasons. It pulls the reader in right away. We're telling you the most important <coughs> reason to keep reading this story. Um, but also, back in olden times, <laughs> and even still today, when you have a story come in and you only have 500 words and the story is 800, to make lives easier for the production team, they just chop from the bottom. 
they are assuming that all the important stuff is at the top. It goes from most important to least important, right? So they're going to chop your story. They're just going to chop off the last 200 words. So you want to have all your important stuff at the top, right? Um, so you would have your hook, your most important piece of information. Then you would have secondary detail. And then the last thing might be a transition into the rest of the story or an important point, OK? What does that look like? If you go to issue 75, page 49, it's this little one about U-turn in Kenya. Now, we had to write this one short and sweet because we didn't even have a whole page to work with. So look at your first paragraph. Somebody want to read the first paragraph? Sure. Hundreds of men found healing from addictions through Jesus Christ at the U-Turn for Christ ministry in Nairobi, Kenya, started by Pastor Duncan Maya in 2008 after he was free from drug addiction and at the U-Turn in Paris, California. Now a second U-Turn ministry in Kenya has opened in Kisi country, seven hours west of Nairobi, to reach those in Western Kenya. Okay, so the first thing I tell you is hundreds of men have found healing from addiction. That is the most important thing. Now we also have something important, another U-turn is opening, right? So we've got two really important points right there at the top of this story. And now I'm going to elaborate, right? I'm going to explain, you know, how these guys found Christ and their names and their quotes and everything. But I've got the most important information right up there at the top, don't I? And not every story is going to start this way, right? We talked about the narrative style lead where you're immediately there with someone on the street hearing about Jesus. That's different. But when you have to write really tight and really short, try to use this style, the inverted pyramid style. Now, if you want more information, go to the Purdue Online Writing Lab. That's P-U-R-D-U-E Online Writing Lab. It's also called the OWL. And Google the words inverted pyramid structure. And if you want to write that next to this little triangle, inverted pyramid structure. You can Google this, you can look at stuff online, and they will explain this mo in more detail. The interesting thing to me about both of these triangles is that they really talk about not only the structure of the first paragraph, but of the whole piece, right? Because in your typical, in your regular triangle, your typical writing, you have your introductory paragraph, your detailed paragraphs, and your conclusion paragraph, right? That is not how an, an article is written. An article gives you the most important stuff up top, then it gives you details, and then it, it ends with maybe some leftover information, like a phone number you could call to find out more or something like that, but it's got your most important stuff at the top, right? So if that doesn't bend your brain too much, <laughs> they're both structures, they're kind of like roadmaps for the structure of the whole piece or just the first paragraph. So if you want to sort of make sure that you've processed everything we talked about, I would go back and look at some of the pieces you've written, see if you can do some cutting. See if you can make them clearer. See if uh, you, you've got some redundant words. See if it's you know active voice or passive voice. Do the research assignment that's on page 26 if you haven't already. Um, if you would like an actual assignment that we would possibly use for this next issue, see me after class. I've got a few that we need done. Um, and that's it. Mm -hmm.